All right, welcome to Family Bible Time, and welcome to the Tennant family. Hooray! Where's Aunt Anita? <laughs> finally, finally got her. <laughs> Thanks to King Charles for getting crowned. <laughs> and having a bank holiday. And yeah. having a bank holiday, giving us bank. Well, this is great. We are in Isaiah, not Isaiah, mm-hmm. Isaiah <laughs> chapter 7. You know, Isaiah chapter 7, you know, because... You hear it read at Christmas. Mm-hmm. It's Isaiah seven fourteen. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. But today we're going to get the context mm-hmm. for Isaiah seven fourteen, which you don't often get mm-hmm. at Christmas. And we're also going to start the book of James. Hooray! Hooray! Mm-hmm. James. Hooray! Hooray! Hooray. Hooray. <laughs> James is James is the first book uh, that I ever taught through sequentially, expositorily at Grace Life London. We started Grace Life London with the book of James, and this was a really great time in James. So we're in for a treat. Let's pray, and well, let's go. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for a day with friends and. Uh, spiritual family, thank you for the blessing of rest, thank you for the blessing of being now able to open your word and to seek you, we pray that you would please reveal yourself to us, please show us more about you, please show us more of your truth, please teach us more about ourselves and about this world and help us to understand things the way you would have us understand it. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. All right, Isaiah chapter 7. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it but could not yet mount an attack against it. Okay, what's happening? First of all, just let's do a moment's geography (laughs) revision. Um, So, Rezin, the king of Syria. Where is Syria? Uh, Up. Up. Very good. (laughs) Syria, if you're in Israel, Syria is, is north. And Syria is north and to the east If you in Israel today. If you go up to the north of Israel, to the Golan Heights, uh, you can look down into Syria. Mm. And um, what's the capital of Syria? Can you remember? Damascus. Damascus. Damascus is the capital of Syria. Now that's going to come up in this chapter. Now... Um, Pika, the son of Remalia, or Remalia, <coughs> probably would be Remalia, wouldn't it? Really? Anyway, uh, I know him as Pika, the son of Remalia. King of Israel um, came up to Jerusalem. Now, when he says king of Israel and coming to Jerusalem, you've got to remember that when Isaiah is writing... This is after the time of the division of the kingdom, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. we've had Solomon, we've had Rehoboam. The kingdom has been split. It's no longer the united kingdom. (laughs) It's the divided kingdom. And because it's divided, we've got Israel in the north and Judah and Benjamin, but sometimes just referred to as Judah in the south. And Israel is like the ten tribes in the north. What was the capital of Israel in those days? If the capital of Syria was Damascus, what was the capital of Israel? Samaria. Samaria. Okay. Don't confuse Samaria with the Samaritans. That's later. That's after the exile, isn't it? The Samaritans came later. But Samaria is the capital of Israel the ten northern tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. 
So that's where Ahab was the king in Samaria and so on. Okay, right. So uh, when is this happening? Do you remember we said Isaiah is prophesying approximately 700 years before Christ. So that's a good ballpark for all of this. It's enough detail for now. Let's keep going. Verse 2. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Why? What's Ephraim got to do with it? Okay, mm -hmm. Ephraim is just shorthand for Israel. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because the um, king of uh, the, 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 the king who was king in Israel was an Ephraimite um, and from Ephraim and so Ephraim became like shorthand for mm -hmm. Israel sometimes, mm -hmm. the northern tribes. So when, now we're talking about when, when, when the people in Judah, when the, when the house of David, that's the house of Judah, when they were told Syria is in league with he says, he says that Ephraim, you can read Israel. Syria and Israel are ganging up on us. They got mm. terrified. Okay, yeah. got the picture? Have mm. I lost you yet? Good. <laughs> Verse 3. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz. Who's Ahaz again? The king of Judah. The king of Judah. It's so confusing because <laughs> you just get yeah. lost. Don't, do you get lost? Am I the only one that gets lost? Yeah, I have to go mm -hmm. that track. You have to kind of keep yeah. going, right, yeah. who's this? All right, all right. So who's Ahaz? All right. Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Isaiah, king of Judah. That's where we started in verse 1. So, so the Lord is telling Isaiah now, go out to meet Ahaz. Ahaz is the king of Judah. Israel and Syria are ganging up on him. So, okay, go out and meet to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. Not pool washer, but um, the washer's field. And say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smouldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and, and the son of Ramalia. Because Syria, with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia, has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken to pieces so that it will no longer be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. What's he saying? I, I, I think in one of the modern translations, it translates it like this, and I think they're right with the sense of it. The head of Syria is only Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only Rezin. I think what's being said is, is God is saying, what are you worrying about? These are just people. They're not, they don't have God on their side. Now look at verse 9 again, the bit that I didn't read. What, didn't, what did I not read yet? At the end. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Wow. You could, you could circle a verse like that. <laughs> that kind of verse needs to be in your mind and on your wall and on, on your heart. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. So who's saying this? This is God saying it. Isaiah is the messenger. He's bringing the message to Ahaz. Ahaz is the king of Judah. Israel and Syria are ganging up on Judah. It looks terrible. It looks like they're stuffed. But then God comes and he says, look, hold on a minute. The head of Syria is Damascus. The head of Damascus is just resin. It's just this guy. He's just a man. 
And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Romalia. That's Pekah. He's nobody. If you don't stand firm in faith, you'll not be firm at all. Mm. So what is God saying to Ahaz? He's saying to Ahaz, listen, you need to trust me. Mm. So, what do you think Ahaz's response is going to be? Verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. So God has just said to him, trust me, I know these two kingdoms are against you and everyone's terrified, everyone's shaking like the, the trees in the wind, but you trust me, okay? Now, ask me for a sign, whatever you want. He says, let it be as deep as Sheol, as deep as the grave, or as high as heaven. He literally gave King Ahaz like the divine equivalent of a, a rub, check. a blank check, <laughs> a blank check, a rub on Aladdin's lamp. <laughs> this is unbelievable, isn't it? What would you ask for? <laughs> <laughs> what would you ask for? <laughs> Someone must know. What would you ask for, Wes? Uh, I have to think about that one. <laughs> Well, you could ask for a lot of things, couldn't you? What would you ask for? Um, I, I'd probably ask for the, the same angel to be sent. Well, that's later on in the story, <laughs> isn't it? That destroyed 185,000 of them. <laughs> um, maybe, uh, maybe... When uh, hey Phil Johnson has preached an amazing sermon on this passage, you can find it on GraceChurch.org. Just go there, search for Isaiah chapter seven, listen to Phil's mm -hmm. sermon. It's brilliant. He said he um, would ask for the wisdom of Solomon and the the strength and sharpness of mind that he had aged eighteen. <laughs> and I thought. That's really a cool idea. <laughs> so I'd probably ask for those. I think Phil got there first. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you could ask for anything, but interesting, Ahaz, well, Ahaz is so, such a sad character. Look at verse 12. This is someone who's pretending to be all spiritual. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. What? <laughs> is Ahaz a good king? No, he is not. Verse 13. And he said, Hear then, O house of J David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall, and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means, don't you? Mm. God with us. Mm. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread, which land whose two kings you dread, are the land of the north, and Pekah and Romalia. So, it's, so this, uh, this is talking about Israel now in the north, and Syria. The land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. What? The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Sorry, mm. since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In other words, this is the... This is the the thing that's coming. So not Syria now, but Assyria. So God is going to bring the king of Assyria 
upon them. And that is going to be the such days that have not been since the, the, since forever. Okay, verse 18. In that day, well, in the day when God brings the king of Assyria, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of the Assyria, and they will come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and on all the pastures. In that day the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. In that day a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. And because of the abundance of milk that they give, he will eat curds for Everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. In other words, there's going to hardly be anyone left. So, so few people that a man keeps alive a young cow and two sheep, and they've got lots because there's so few people to eat, eat it. In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come, hit, come there for all the land will be briars and thorns. In other words, you're going to go hunting there, but not to gather, gather grapes. And as for the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns. But they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. Mm -hmm. In other words, the land is going to be ruined. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be hardly anyone left. The land is going to be ruined. The land is going to be devastated. The people are going to be killed by the coming of the king of Assyria. Ouch. And God had offered him a sign, any sign, not to worry about Pekah and Romalia. And he wouldn't take it. So then God gives him a sign. The sign is a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they call his name Emmanuel. And he'll eat curds and honey. And when he's a young boy, he's before he gets to a certain age, all of all of this is going to happen. All yeah. oh, righty, what's that got to do with Jesus? <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Well, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a vir the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, mm. I've got to open this out to you and say that amongst Christians, amongst very good interpreters of the Bible, there are people that fall into two different camps at this point. There are people who believe that in the days of Isaiah, this prophecy was fulfilled. And so a virgin conceived, or a child, called his name Emmanuel. And before he grew up, um, to this point, all these things took place. And it also referred to Jesus in the future. And that's a pattern that you see in the Bible of a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. You see sometimes a partial near fulfillment and then the full, the, the kind of full picture is fulfilled later with respect to Jesus or with respect to the end of, end of times and things like that. So that's one way of looking at this. Another way that people try to interpret this is this, this is all just referring to Jesus and no, there was no virgin and no um, child called Emmanuel back then. We don't have the historical records to show it either way. I just want to point out to you that there are those two views out there in the interpretive world. I lean towards the first one. And I think, the, I think it's legitimate to say that there's a... Uh, a, a young woman who had not had sexual intercourse, who was a virgin, who was then conceived and she bore a son and um, was that 
conception, therefore back then natural conception and Jesus' birth was the miraculous one. Mm. I don't know. We don't get that part of the story back here in Isaiah. So I, I'm not going to pronounce on it. I don't have have to prove anything. I'm just going to say I think it's quite possible that there was a near fulfillment and then the ultimate fulfillment was brought to pass in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, that's enough for me for now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think it is enough to say when you come to Matthew and he says, look, this is to fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet. Mm. He's pointing back under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's pointing back to this and he's saying, look, this is this is the ultimate fulfillment of so Jesus is being born of a virgin is the ultimate fulfillment of this and that's cool Mm. all right James you right? tired? (laughs) we're all tired aren't we? Who is James? The son of uh, the the brother of Jesus. The brother of Jesus and not the, the son. <laughs> not the son of Jesus. No. The brother of Jesus. The brother of Jude. So James and Jude. So James, the a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse one. Isn't that interesting? He introduces himself not as James, the brother of Jesus but as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was humble, yeah. wasn't he? Mm-hmm. To the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Mm-hmm. Now, James goes straight in. Here we go. Chapter 1 introduces the theme of the letter, which is trials. Count it all Joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower fails and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Each of his own will, he will... he. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, 
that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to anger, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, He's like a man who looks intently at his, his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hero who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It's very unpopular to talk today in Christian circles about worldliness. Worldliness, but it's actually a big deal in the Bible to, mm. to keep oneself unstained from the world. Nowadays, nowadays Christians are kind of trying to see how worldly they can be with the idea that if we could only be like people in the world, then they will like us mm -hmm. and then they'll want to become Christians. But the Bible puts it the other way around. The Bible says we're to be different. Keep, keep yourself unstained from the world. That's mm -hmm. how James 1 ends. We're to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We're to be people who put into practice the things that we learn. And if we don't, it's hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And so we can't just carry on being angry people. We need to learn to tame our tongues, to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. We can't, we can't carry on in the filthiness and rampant wickedness of the world. Verse 21, we have to put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. We, just, we need to be the people who are just like feeding on the Bible every day mm -hmm. and saying, please change me, Lord. Change me, Lord. Don't make, let me be like this world. Please change me. That's clear, isn't it? The other thing that's clear in James chapter 1 is, is just the, the amazing contrast between the picture that you get here of what we're supposed to, how we're supposed to react when we suddenly find ourselves in trials and how most Christians react when bad things happen to them. <laughs> Let's just put it like that. I mean, how do most people, how do most Christians react when bad things happen to them? Well, most of us do something like a panic attack version, like on Monsters, Inc. You know, remember when the, the child, a human child, got into the monster world mm -hmm. and what did they do they kind of ran around going oh a child a child a human child panicking <laughs> screaming 
Because most people, when bad things happen to them, they're like, oh, I can't believe it. This is all going wrong. (laughs) (laughs) As if that was something strange that was happening to us. This is a very different picture, isn't it? So, So let me just put it out there so that I don't paint a false picture of myself. I still am shocked and disappointed every time I come into a new trial. I'm still shocked and disappointed that I haven't managed to learn how to do this. It's kind of like, okay, here's a new trial. And my instant reaction is is kind of like, oh, no, oh, dear, oh, poor. It kind of inwardly, I don't, wouldn't ever say this, but inwardly, it's like, poor me. But my reaction, according to this, ought to be, wow, let's see what the Lord's going to do now. <laughs> How's the Lord going to help us through this? Count it all joy, my brothers. Mm. Just like pure gold. This is great. We've got this new situation. This is going to be interesting. How's the Lord going to help us through this one? Why, how could you have that attitude? Well, you could have that attitude if you really, really believed and had this at the forefront of your mind mm. that you know, verse 3, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So you know that, okay, I'm being tested. Mm. This is a test. And this testing is going to make me steadfast. Mm. And I need to let steadfastness have its full effect, verse 4. That I can be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It doesn't mean perfect as in morally perfect. It means, it means, f- like finished. God is working on finishing us, on getting us into a state of completeness, lacking nothing. Mm. We, we do lack something right now, which is maturity, which is steadfastness, um, steadiness. You would say under fire. Uh, And so we need the trials. And so we ought to be thinking, okay, here comes the next bout of sanctification. (laughs) Mm. This will be good. See what the Lord's going to do. And we really ought to think like that. Mm -hmm. Because do you know what? In my life, I can look back and think about the trials that we've gone through together. Mm. In our marriage. uh, In life in Mm. churches we've been part of and yes they've been horrible and yes it's been difficult and yes sometimes we look back and go oh we want to relive that but guess what God has been at work in us Mm. and God has changed us and God has been maturing us and God has been making us steady steady so that when things happen that used to happen, that used to make us go, ah, like that, <laughs> now you kind of go, hmm, instead. <laughs> How many times have you heard us go, hmm? <laughs> many a time, right? Because you're like, okay, I remember this. Yeah, okay. The Lord taught us that one. We learned that, didn't we? No need to panic. This is probably going to be painful, but we'll get through it. The Lord will help us through. So you learn things, and God sanctifies you. And so you don't have to panic. You can consider it all pure joy. Um, The key is we've got to learn to remain steadfast. Verse 12, blessed, happy is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test... He will receive the crown of life, Mm -hmm. which God has promised to those who love him. Okay, so do you want the crown of life? Mm -hmm. Do you know that this is a test? It is a test. So will you stand the test? Will you consider it pure joy? Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we ask you to please work in us. Please work in me, Lord, so that the next time I can have a better attitude and respond 
with more trust mm. uh, and joy even at the trial. And Lord, so help us to trust you so much that we, like you said to Ahaz, if, if we're not firm in faith, we won't be firm at all. We won't. Lord, we realize that we need to trust you. Please work in us. Lord, you see that we do believe, but help our unbelief. Mm. Our faith is puny, but we know that there is a power to puny faith, and we thank you for it. And Lord, we pray that you would please work more and more faith in us mm. and allow us to trust you day by day and to live out the Christian life in a way that pleases you. Mm. So we thank you. Thank you for today and all the blessings in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 All right, we are done. James! We're in James. We'll be back again tomorrow. Camera queen, can you do your stuff? And we will say adios amigos. <laughs> Ta-da for now.